Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Cormac Smith and Philip Ingram, both who have been guests separately on the channel, uh, but I thought it would be a fantastic combination to get them together. Also, they collaborate on their own media project, uh, so I think the shared insights might be useful for the audience. Cormac Smith has worked in public relations and corporate communications for over three decades. In 2016, he traveled to Ukraine to take up a special appointment as the strategic communication advisor to Pavla Klimkin, then the foreign minister of Ukraine. He was attached to the British embassy in Kiev, but was embedded in Ukraine's Minister of Foreign Affairs, the first foreigner to hold such a position. Philip Ingram is a journalist and consultant who's built on a long and senior military career as an intelligence, counterintelligence and security officer and planner. Philip has extensive business experience, especially in steel manufacturing. He also has extensive media experience appearing on the BBC Sky News and radio networks, as well as international networks, including Al Jazeera, TRT World, CNN, and many, many others. Welcome to Silicon Curtain. If you like this video at the end, please do make sure you like the video, check that you are subscribed so that you don't miss any of our content. And also please check out the validated Ukrainian charities that appear in the description of the video. Gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you back to the channel. Thank you for having us back. I won't necessarily throw the questions at one or other, but we'll we'll see who is more desperate to sort of, uh, you know, grab each one like sort of tidbits uh, thrown from the table. Um, let's start with the Kursk campaign, because it seems there are two extraordinary things that have gone into its success. One is secrecy and one is surprise. And there are two ways, perhaps, in which Western partners have proved to be somewhat of a liability over the last three years. It seems that Ukraine has not told its partners that it was going to be mounting an operation of this sort precisely to maintain secrecy and surprise. What is your understanding of this? Cormac, I don't know if, if, if you're happy for me to start. You know, I'm very happy. Philip, I'm very happy for you to start on this. You know, it's it's one of the principles of this type of operation. And your secrecy and surprise are effectively the same thing. You, you only get one chance to surprise your enemy. Um, and um, a lot of what Ukraine's done beforehand because of um, its links internationally and the way information gets passed around um, it's very difficult when you uh, give detail out into the international community for you to maintain that complete secrecy that enables you to have the surprise. Something has got the potential to leak. And therefore, the Ukrainians have been very, very careful here in the planning of their operation and in the execution. So the timing of when uh, they, they uh, launched it and how they launched it with what forces um, they've, they've managed to keep that very close hold indeed. Now, I'm sure that they will have talked to some of the international um, uh, liaison teams that are helping them in different places. They might not have given them the full detail, but they will have known who they can trust and, and who um, will, be, will have been able to bounce ideas off without necessarily passing that back into their their own masters in different ways. But that um, number of people will have been able to be counted on the fingers of one hand, if not even fewer than that, because it comes down straight to personal relationships. But this would never have worked if they hadn't got surprised in the first place. Um, and it's a key principle of this type of uh, this type of warfare. And Philip, if I could add to that, I think there's something about you know, it's easier sometimes to apologize for going too yeah. far than to ask for permission in the first place. And given the uh, given what we're seeing, what we're seeing over Storm Shadow and the use of other long range artillery, I think there could well have been and the feeling I get from talking to people, there could well have been a there could have well have been an issue that if they had been more open with um, allies, not only could this have leaked. Um, but also, the um, allies may have may well have um, expressed their reticence and asked Ukraine not um, not to do this because, again, you know, invading Russia first time Russia has been invaded since 1945, and we know about Russia's nuclear doctrine. But the one time when they will resort to nuclear weapons is if the motherland is invaded. So 
I think we could, I think the Ukrainians might have expected that if they had told people, they might well have come up against um, some um, stiff opposition to their planning. So I think for two reasons, it was very, very, very important that they kept this very, very quiet. It's a masterstroke in Ukrainian planning. You know, they they have looked at the whole situation um, and you know the difficulties that they're having in the East uh, and are continuing to have in the East, but it's... Uh, instead of banging the head against the same brick wall or putting the same DVD in and hoping that you're going to see a different ending to the movie, they've gone, no, we have to change it. And they've wrestled the initiative back in a way that, you know, as a military planner, as someone who's planned these sorts of operations on many, many occasions and looked at it, it put a wry smile on my face. And I thought, yes, you uh, have been very clever here. Well done. It's an interesting question here, because whereas... Um, escalation management, the fear of Russian reaction is one limiting factor. Is another limiting factor convincing allies that this might actually succeed? Because throughout this war and prior to this, we've seen seeded into the Western uh uh, one of my speakers on the channel called it vatnalist sphere, uh, and that is essentially people who assume that Russia is inevitable, invincible, that its resources are eternal and inexhaustible. That, of course, is not the case. Ukrainians seem to have planned and executed this operation believing that it would be successful. Maybe they didn't anticipate how successful it would be, but they wouldn't have gone in unless they thought there was a decent chance, uh, not only of it succeeding tactically on the ground, but achieving a whole number of objectives. We'll come to those objectives in a minute because we can't know all of them. And the ones that have been publicly admitted likely are not the full total. But is there a problem on the Western side that we still overestimate Russia, underestimate Ukraine, and actually... The, the major voices in policy making lack the imagination to see how victory might be achieved. But Ukraine is not constrained in the same way. Let me just say two things, then, Philip, I'm sure you will want to come in. One on the overestimating um, Russia, I think, you know, that is absolutely a case. And, and Philip knows the old joke that it was back in Back, back in February of 2022, it was said that um, Russia had the second most powerful army on mm -hmm. Earth. Um, more recently, it's become obvious that Russia had the second most powerful army in Ukraine. It's now been said that maybe Russia has the second most powerful army in Russia. So I think, you know, that's a that's a joke, if you like, to emphasize the fact that we have overestimated Russia's military force. And you'll say more about this, Philip, but I think corruption has led to much of Russia's army being effectively a hollowed out husk. But the other thing that I want to say from my experience um, of, you know, working with working very closely at the heart of the Ukrainian government for a year and a half. And Philip knows, and I think, you know, Jonathan, it was a life changing experience. It was a country and a people and a culture that I fell in love with. And I couldn't help feeling, and maybe more so because I was an outsider, I was a first-time diplomat, and it was probably the only diplomatic job I was ever going to do in my life. And I could not help feeling that we in the West in general simply did not respect the Ukrainians sufficiently. Mm -hmm. There was something about, you know, these, yes, they're all very brave and they're this, that and the other, but they're not quite as sophisticated or as clever as we are in the West. And there was a effect, well, you know, I was over there as a communication advisor. And there was a there was there was very much among the people in the donor community who I um not all I've got to say, but some in the donor community from different countries. Well, you know, if you do things the way we do them in London or Washington DC or Paris, then things will improve. And yeah, this is this is a, a this is a long-standing personal feeling about not just underestimating the Ukrainians and overestimating the Russians, but actually not giving the Ukrainians sufficient respect. There's there's so much in this. Um, before Zelensky, Ukraine was operating even even after um, the the start of the democratic uh, the democratization of of Ukraine. Um, Ukraine was still operating like um, an old Soviet state. Um, corruption, oligarchs, 
uh, headed everything and influenced everything. Zelensky came in on an anti-corruption ticket and was starting to shake things up, which is why he was very, very unpopular amongst um, uh, you know, the hierarchy that there was in Ukraine as he came in until this war started. Um, I think we've been overestimating Russia for many, many, many years. Um, and that's because we have gone away from our intelligence agencies um, giving an understanding as to the reality of the capability to allowing our defence industrial base to look at potential threats and providing over-engineered or over-capable um, solutions to what were potential and theoretical threats that are out there. You know, a classic example is the Russian um, T-14 Amata tank that was supposed to be something that no um, uh, Western weapon system could ever get through. It was going to be so reliable and capable and everything else that would defeat any Western tank. And the Russians actually haven't been able to get it off the parade square to the point where they are not producing sufficient numbers or any numbers and they're not going to bring it into the fight in um, uh, in, in Ukraine. And their latest tank, the T-90, you know, when we look at um, the 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 way that influenced the the Western defense industrial base, you know the the manufacturers of our anti tank missiles turned around and said our block one version of the missiles will never get through the frontal armor and destroy this tank. You need to buy our block two. Well, what we're finding is that the older versions of the Block 1 missiles, and the difference was a single warhead to a tandem warhead, the older versions of the Block 1 missiles are not only defeating it, but they're turning it into scraps of little pieces of metal because um, they're very effective indeed. And therefore, we have been driven by industrial desire for industrial dollars rather than a real threat. And again, when we look at the estimations of how how capable Russia is at the moment. The latest UK defence intelligence assessment of the Russian troops that they're putting into trying to hold back the um, Ukrainians in the Kursk region are saying that they're taking aircraft technicians, they're taking uh, maintainers, they're taking non-infantry and non-combat armed trained people and putting them in the front line in units. Uh, they're taking Air Force individuals and putting them into infantry roles to try and hold them back. That says that Russia is desperate for manpower. And again, that assessment is reinforced by the fact that Russia has gone to North Korea for ammunition, basic ammunition, artillery ammunition. That means Russia's defense industrial base is not keeping up with uh, the expenditure that it's using. It's gone to North Korea to ask for specialist personnel, engineers and the like. That means that Russia hasn't got those people that are there. And it takes years, tens of years to train uh, and get the experience out of people that you need in the battlefield. And that's why they're having to go elsewhere. And that's why they're also going to Iran for some of their more sophisticated weapons, their Shahad 136 and 131 drones and some of their ballistic missiles and North Korea ballistic missiles as well. And if you're relying on North Korea, I'm sorry, the reliability of what they produce is something I, I would never put a North Korean shell in a gun um, and pull the lanyard myself. I would um, want to be several kilometers away because the chances of it leaving the end of the barrel um, are uh, smaller than it exploding in the gun and, and causing all of the crew um, real issues. So I think we have been almost suckered into uh, assessing Russia as stronger than it is um, and assessing it as stronger than it is um, for economic reasons. And that's been driven by um, our, our defense industrial base rather than getting a true understanding. And then when we look at the, the way the Russians train, They've never trained for this sort of operation. And this is where it's interesting that they're now asking for North Korean support and potentially Chinese support because they've never trained for these sorts of operations. They always train in the same way. It's something that's scripted. So you know, they haven't had the realism of providing logistic support, the realism of providing the, um, the fog of war coming in and influencing everything that you do because that's never been in the script and they're suddenly realizing it. They are very adaptable and they're proving their adaptability, which is why they're having some success in the East. 
but the Ukrainians are in a unique position because their staff officers and their planners have trained in the Western staff colleges. You know, I had the first Ukrainian staff officer at the UK's Advanced Command and Staff College course um, back in 1996 because he was in my syndicate and became a very good friend. But they've also had their officers off training in the Russian staff colleges um, for many years, and they've got that experience there. They know the best of both. They know the worst of both. And what they're doing is been able to bring that together in a unique way that no other military has got that experience. Just like to add two things to what Philip was saying. One, in terms of the overestimating of Russia, there's a tendency to... There's a tendency to think of the Russian army in terms of the army of the old Soviet army of the USSR. Now, we've got to remember, you know, Ukraine was one of 15 Soviet socialist republics. But when I was out there, I was told they they accounted for up to 40 percent of GDP or industrial output. Um, also, you know, I befriended actually was the father of a, of a senior diplomat, a, a chap who was a colonel in the Soviet army who fought in Afghanistan. And I spent a number of very, very enjoyable nights with this man. And this man was an absolute, you know, U Ukrainian patriot who in his mid seventies stood on the Maidan with his wife. So that was the first thing There was, I think there was clearly a, um, a, 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 a there was clearly, um, there was clearly an element where the Soviet army relied very, very heavily on Ukraine, as the Soviet Union relied heavily on Ukraine for many things, for their rocket technology, for the breadbasket, and for many, many other things, but in particular for the technology. The second thing that I learned when I was out there between 2016 and 2018, you know, I went out as a communication advisor, but for me, communication and leadership are two sides of the one coin mm. and what i started to notice very very early on was that in the ministry of foreign affairs it was still hidebound with this soviet top-down leadership mentality which of course is not you know an absence of actually of trust and of devolving leadership down through the ranks but the longer i was there and as i started making friends with royal canadian mounted police who were overworking with various police forces and people in Operation Orbital, and the Yanks, and the uh, Canadians who were also working with the Ukrainian military, everybody started telling me the same story. And in fact, it was a large part of the work that I did in um, communication leadership. And I, you know, I believe that whereas, you know, as a result of a lot of that training from in the Brits among others, in 2019, I believe that the end, the whole NCO core of the Ukrainian armed forces was very significantly um, um, upgraded. And this was something the Russians never did. In fact, the NCO core, and Philip, you'll know more about this than me, but the NCO core in the Russian army is is famously very, very corrupt. Yeah. And, you know, I learned something because in the second leadership conference that I did for the top 70 or 80 um, um, most senior diplomats in Kyiv, I, um, I brought in the commander at the time of Operation Orbital. And he talked about something called, which you'll be well aware of, Philip, the strategic corporal. Yeah. And that kind of got the message through to people that under certain circumstances you know complex strategic decisions can be can be can be devolved down to the most junior nco on the pitch now you know at the same time i'm sitting talking to anatoly senior the man who had risen to colonel and fought in afghanistan and he told me stories about how they lost men because they couldn't, they didn't have the permission, even at the level of colonel, to make certain decisions. Yeah. They had to wait for it either to come back from headquarters or, in some cases, from Moscow. So I think, though, that those two things, I'll, I'll finish, in, Philip, I'll go back over to you. Yeah, in, in, in military terms, that's the difference between what we call mission command and directed command. You know, the Russians have, they operate under directed command. It's hierarchical, it comes down from the top. So you tell a soldier to go from A to B, soldier gets to B and waits for next instruction. In mission command, you tell the soldier that we're going from A to B, but we're going to B to do this. So if the soldier doesn't actually make it to B, they realize what it is that you're trying to do. And you've empowered them to say, well, actually, I know I'm going to be to do this, but actually I've got stuck, but I can still do this by taking a slightly different route. 
route. And then I know from B that the next objective, because you've given me what it is that I want to do, or that that I understand what it is we're trying to achieve, is going to be probably this. So they will start to work that um, and and use use that through. Uh, and again, what what that's just reminded me of is yet yet another little joke that I think uh, you know, Comac we've we've shared before, mm -hmm. and I, and I saw re recently online, and it was um, you know, Putin sitting there. Um, you know, in a seance, and um, he's connected with Stalin, and is asking, as said to Stalin, um, you know, we, you know, Russia has just been invaded. You were the last leader to deal with um the, the last invasion of Russia. What advice can you give to me? And he and Stalin turns around to Putin and says, "That's very easy. Get your Ukrainian troops to go and deal with the invaders, and call on the Americans for support." <laughs> And this is an interesting question because we then clearly have been training the Ukrainians to be able to make devolved decisions, to give some degree of autonomy to people at the sort of unit level that you're talking about. Uh, we've been training them for mobile and maneuver warfare. We've given them tanks, equipment, Bradleys, etc., to be mobile and maneuverable. And yet we seem to have insisted that they fight an attritional trench style high tech trench warfare which is extremely static and doesn't play to any of these advantages have ukraine looked at this and thought that they are on a slow attritional way to defeat if they carry on that fight and here they've created a space in kursk that actually plays to the very things we've equipped and trained them to do philip to lead on this yeah i'll i'll, I'll jump into this one kursk is the first time that we've seen and um, what we describe in military terms as um, all arms, combined armed warfare coming together in the way that's been trained. The Ukrainians before this have not had the wherewithal to do it. Um, and that's no fault of the Ukrainians. It's they, they have been doing something that the British military couldn't do, the US military couldn't do and all the rest of it. They've been re-equipping. They've been changing their doctrine from the lowest possible level. So... Um, if we look at this in tank um, warfare, the, the Soviet-style tanks, the T-series, have got a crew of three. The Western tanks have got a crew of four. You're changing the dynamics at such a small team level, and you're then having to build that up to troop level, so three tanks, up to squadron level, you know, um, 10, 12 plus tanks, up to, re uh, up to battalion level, up to regimental level, and get them to work together. That's just on the tanks. Now you're changing the way their infantry are fighting and you're putting them into infantry fighting vehicles um, that, that are different, where you know, the old um, Soviet BMPs are effectively battlefield taxis, where you, you'll get into a position, they should go off and give fire support and your infantry fight through. Now with Bradleys and the, and the like, you can fight through the position from within the vehicle, dismount and come back on it. But you're having to do that in conjunction with working with your tanks. You're then doing that in conjunction with working with your artillery. You're then doing that in conjunction with working with your armoured engineers. And all of this is with equipment that you've never trained before on. So you're having to pull your troops from the front line to train them in this and, and get them to work out all together. That's just in the army terms. You then need to create, and this is where we have not, the Ukrainians have not had the wherewithal to do this, create what's called local air superiority around what your ground forces are trying to do. So you put this bubble of air superiority around, which stops the um, Russian forces, um, the enemy forces, from um, influencing you with their drones, with their helicopters, with their fixed-wing aircraft. That's where the Russians are having real advantage at the minute because they're still influencing that. Because you're taking... Um, pilots and training them in Western aircraft with Western weapon systems on it. It's not training them how to fly it. It's training them how to fight it. And it's not training them how to fight it just in the air, but it's fighting it from that um, all arms combined perspective. And the, the, uh, the UK military to take our basic troops and put them through a cycle where they've been through this cycle several times, but you, you take them at the lowest level of readiness and you get them up to the highest level of training um, to work in this sort of combined arms joint environment it takes two years. It's a two year cycle. The Ukrainians have done this in six months, um, you know, eight to nine months pushing it and they haven't had the aircraft brought in. This is phenomenal. This is super human in what they've managed to achieve and how they've managed to do it 
um, if we'd given them all of the equipment at the very beginning and said, oh, just get on with it, they'd have lost it. They wouldn't have known how to do that. And that would have had a massive psychological effect in the Ukrainians, psychological effect in the international community supporting them. Um, and uh, you, we, they would probably be put in a position where the, the, the international community would be forcing the Ukrainians to a negotiating table to give up territory. By giving them the equipment slowly and making sure they know how to properly use it and integrate it and everything else, it's counterintuitive. It's costing more Ukrainian lives, but in the long run, it's probably saving more of Ukraine and therefore Ukrainian people and uh, their their identity. It's it is so complex. Uh, you know, I I it took me many 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 years to learn how to you know, bring all of this together, and you you have teams of people to do this. I take my hat off to what they've managed to achieve. And just to add quickly before uh, Cormac jumps in, have Ukrainians had to integrate another element here, which actually has not been a traditional part of Western doctrine, and that is electronic warfare. But electronic warfare to counter threats that just a couple of years ago didn't exist. You know, mass surveillance drones, mm. mass UAVs, this kind of stuff. No, the, the electronic warfare is, is a critical part of all of it. It's part of the all arms battle. It has it has been the whole way through. Um, there, there are new elements coming in, which are the which are the drones and everything else. Drones are in electronic warfare terms, relatively simple to deal with. There's only a few frequencies that the commercial drones operate um, around. This is where you know, the, the, the two things I left out in my descriptions are the defense innovation. So it's innovating to bring in new frequencies and new capabilities and new ways of making things jamming proof and, and intercept proof and all the rest of it. And the second thing that the Ukrainians have brought in, which is um, something that the history books are going to be written about and is going to be studied for many, many years to come, is what I call their special operations, executive type operations that they're um, uh, launching across Russia um, and across occupied Ukraine. And this is all under General Badanov, the head of the GUR, or it's called HUR as well, um, the, their um, uh, military intelligence organization. And that's the Russian factories catching fire, their railway um, uh, points, boxes catching fire, their um, uh, oil refineries being hit by drones. It's the drone attacks deep into Russia. It's the um, sea drone attacks sinking a third of and putting out of action 50% of the Russian Black Sea fleet. It's the commando raids into Crimea um, that are helping to target the S-400 and S-300 air defense systems and the, um, the, the military headquarters that are there and the logistic bases that are there that are hollowing the Russians out from behind when they can't afford that to be hollowed out. Um, and what that does is no matter how strong their frontline wall is, if you hollow it out from behind, that frontline bit is going to collapse at some stage. And that's what Badanov is leading on. And that's something that's new as well. The innovation that's coming out of this from the Ukrainians is superb, but we shouldn't underestimate the Russian responses to it. You're mainly a military man, although a great communicator, but I'm a communicator and I, I love sound bites and one liners. And one of the first sound bites that I began deploying back before in January of 22 was arm Ukraine to the teeth and sanction Russia back to the Stone Age. And I've learned a lot, you know, commenting on media on this over the last two and a half years, because I was constantly saying, look, there's three weapon systems they need. It's long range artillery, it's modern battle tanks and it's fighter jets. And I remember well sitting down with you about a year ago and saying, look, why why are we not giving them this stuff quicker? And you explained as you've just as you've just set out. But I think the point that I wanted to make, the point that I want to make, you said to me about a week ago, you know, we couldn't do what they have done. You I yeah. mean, you have been amazed at the speed yeah. of the Ukrainian adaption. And the other thing, that, another example of that was, you know, was it a year, year and a half ago, they were first given Patriot air defense systems. Mm -hmm. And again, the trainers on those, I was hearing reports back, were absolutely stunned at how quickly the Ukrainians were learning and adapting to a very, very complex system. So again, you know, very, very personal. I have faith I have great faith in Ukrainians and belief in Ukrainians. We need to give the Ukrainians more respect. Yeah, I, I agree completely with all of that. And a point that, I mean, the next bit we're going to come on to is what are the strategic objectives? Because um, Zelensky's come out and he's given some, I rather tend to treat those as, yes, I'm sure they're true, but they may not be the main reasons, even though they're being positioned as that, 
he said that they want to create a buffer zone um, to obviously uh, support the Sumi and Kharkiv regions, uh, push Russian artillery range back, etc. It's a nice idea. Um, he's also said that it's a great way to get more Russian prisoners of war so they can exchange them for Ukrainians. Again, it's a nice idea that people can latch on to. It's not necessarily a war winning idea. So what are potentially the other strategic objectives, the ones they're not talking about, the ones they don't want to flag to the Russians, at least in public? Don't I mean, you know, there's a lot of speculation about objectives and you know, I don't know. One thing I do know, and I spent, I spoke to about six different people in Kiev and in um, one or two embassies around Europe this morning, um, and I asked them a simple question: What has the, what has the effect of the Kursk campaign been on morale of the Ukrainian people, of Ukrainian diplomats and politicians? and also of the Ukrainian armed forces. And what I'm getting back, and I'm, I'm talking about senior diplomats, I'm talking about journalists, I'm talking about people living in Kyiv, um, holding various positions and doing various jobs. And the absolute unanimous clarity that I got, this has been a massive shot in the arm for Ukrainians. And it, and. And and again, you know, Philip, it was the it was the great um, was it um, 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 Russian General von Clausewitz that said in war, you need three elements to work together to succeed. You need your government. You need your army, of course, but you also need your people. Mm -hmm. And Ukraine has been good at this. But we've got to remember Ukraine. Ukraine has been absolutely beaten down for two and a half years they have uh, the people in the occupied territories have suffered from some of the most horrible atrocities entire cities have been razed to the ground and they are tired they are you know they cannot give up as a friend of mine said right back at the start of this invasion if russia stops fighting there will be you know there will be no war if ukraine stops fighting there will be no Ukra ukraine and i have sometimes mm. wondered when talking to some very close friends, how much longer? Yes, we say the Ukrainians are brave and they're hard as nails and all of that, but they're human. And I have wondered often how long can they hold on? And I think that the the the, the you know that and, and and Philip, you will know, I mean, morale is so important mm -hmm. in time of war. And this has been an absolute huge morale boost but also it's what has it done to the morale of ukraine's allies how much more positive has this made ukraine's allies we hope we wait to see and i, I suspect this is something that jonathan will come on to more but philip over to you yeah no you, you've you've hit one of the objectives square on the head um and it's 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 the impact that it's having uh, from a morale perspective on the russians on those that are supporting the russians as well um because you know, it will have it will be undermining uh, Putin's position in Moscow with his uh, oligarch central base. It'll be undermining his confidence in his security apparatus because border security is an FSB responsibility, um, uh, but the military as well. So it wouldn't surprise me if in the coming weeks we start to see a purge in Moscow with more people taking up window cleaning or deciding that they're going to have a heart attack next weekend um, or falling down the stairs. Um, Zelensky's language has been fascinating. You know, you mentioned him saying, I want to do this to create a buffer. I suspect if you watch his face as he's doing that, he's got a wry smile on it. Because one of Putin's recent statements um, in saying, uh, uh, in describing what he's trying to do in the East and what he's trying to do with um, the Russian um, move into the Kharkiv region was he was saying I wanted to create a buffer zone um, in Ukraine uh, and everything else. So, so Zelensky is turning the language and the communications uh, message straight back at Putin again and effectively um, uh, making a very rude gesture in his direction with the language that he's choosing. So you know, I, I had a smile when I saw that. But I think you know, in military terms what are the Ukrainians trying to achieve? Um, if you're planning something like this, you, disc you, you the the end of your plan is what you'd call um, uh, 
you 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 put it in a, and, and describe it as your limit of exploitation. How far am I going to go? What am I going to achieve? And there's a lot of factors that will come into that. How many troops can I put in? What density of troops do I need um, against the threat in the particular area? How long are my logistic lines of communication going to be? And what threat are they under? Can I contain? Can I maintain this? Um, and um, all of that will have been pre-planned in, in everything that the Ukrainians are doing. And I think from a strategic perspective, they've already achieved their objectives. And I put those objectives as sending a clear message to the international community that you can cross Putin's biggest red line and nothing happens. So give us authority to use long range weapons against military targets in Russia, no matter what he says, he's not going to respond because he can't. He hasn't got the wherewithal. It's sending a message to Putin. The Ukrainians have effectively given Putin the bird. The middle finger is up at him going, you know, we can take your territory and we can take more of it in a shorter period of time than you can take of ours. Um, and you know that has been very effective. But more importantly, um, two other elements to there. One, the international community. So Xi Jinping, who's been tacitly supporting Putin and providing lots of components, um, but the price that um, Putin will be paying will be access to natural resources and um, you know lots of Russian territory um, and, 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 and elements physically within Russia. Xi Jinping will be going, is my investment safe? Uh, what do I need to do? Uh, Vladimir Putin is not um, providing that security that he said he could guarantee for where I'm investing my time, money and everything else. And therefore, it'll be wobbling that. It'll be wobbling the inner circle of his oligarchs and their criminal networks that are um, underpinning everything that he does. And it wouldn't surprise me if there's little conversations going on between numbers of the oligarch going, right, who's going to take over next? Who's going to be the oligarch in chief and make sure that our businesses are um, kept going in a way that we can still enjoy our lifestyles and our um, you know, twenty-year-old wives can still get access to you know, all of the Gucci stuff and everything else that that they expect. Otherwise, they'll be in trouble. But more importantly, within that, there's the Russian people. You know, we've got two hundred thousand plus um, displaced people from the Kursk region are getting into other Russian towns and cities and heading up towards Moscow, and they're bringing a reality in that has been hidden from them. Um, for for so much, the Russian people have managed to those that have. Uh, understood what's going on, put it out of their minds and said, the war is in Ukraine. Uh, it's not going to affect us at all. Now it's in Russia and they're going, this could affect us. So that's a big thing. Then you've got the military implications of it um, and it's forcing the Russians to um, look at ways of taking what would be the reserves or other troops that they'd be pushing into the east and possibly taking troops out of the east and bringing them around to try and um, hold the Ukrainians back. Um, there's no evidence that the Russians have done that yet, um, but they are, will certainly be planning on it because they can't afford this to go to go on any any further, um, and therefore that will weaken the, uh, the the Russian troops elsewhere. And this is where that's important because you're not going to do something as sophisticated as this unless you know what you're going to do next, and therefore this is going to be phase one of a number of things that the Ukrainians are going to do. I think, and what the others are going to be. Nobody knows in the same way we didn't know beforehand. And then the final bit is, as um, Cormac eloquently put, is that morale shot in the arm for the for the Ukrainian military and for the Ukrainian people. Um, and, you know, I think for the West as well, uh, even though our politicians have been caught on the hop, they're smiling and going, actually, these people can do good things with what we give them. Um, and hopefully, once we get through the political hiatus of this year with all the numerous elections and the difficulties that there are there, because domestic politics is affecting um, the uh, the decision making to support Ukraine. Once we get through that, um, I think the gloves will come off later this year or uh, uh, certainly into early 2025. On that, Philip said, you know, we don't know what's going to happen next. Well, I'm, I'm sure, Philip, you're aware, two pieces of breaking news today. The Ukrainians have now started to invade another oblast, Bryansk. Yeah. But also, Ukrainian drones are have hit a Russian airfield above the Arctic Circle, 2,000 kilometers from the Ukrainian border with yeah. their own with their own 
homemade drones. And this is, again, this is, I said five days ago in an interview, you know, Ukraine has stunned the world. Well, these are two more, these are two more stunning developments. And, you know, this was first before I read it on the news. I have a very good source in Kiev and who is one of my most um, pessimistic friends, a very close friend. And he has a real um, spring in his step, if I can use that as <laughs> as an analogy. When he talks to me, we talk regularly. If we're not talking, we're messaging and so forth. And just the difference in uh, Petro is his name, but you know the difference, the difference in um, the difference in his tone is really noticeable. But yeah. That's and uh, conversations I've had with Ukrainians today echo that as well on the civilian level, uh, that it has been transformative for morale. And of course, public opinion was starting to slide towards some kind of a negotiated position, etc. through sheer exhaustion. I would imagine that that would be put to bed for a while with this campaign. Now, we are going to end on how this has been received in Western capitals and what Western support needs to do now. Words, one thing, actions, rather. Before we get to that, I wanted to float my own sort of uh, theory that we've been talking about on the channel about why this is important. And this, again, could be another key difference between how Ukraine understands the situation and something perhaps its Western allies miss. And this is the deep psychological impact of this incursion on the Russians, not just because of the historical echoes of German tanks advancing through Kursk to denazify Russia. I mean, it's dripping with wonderful historical irony there, but that's maybe not the psychological impact. Um, I'm thinking much more if you've seen the uh, film with Michael Caine and Sean Connery, where they pretend to be man gods and create a little mini empire uh, somewhere in uh, you know northern northern India. At some point, one of them is wounded and the people who look at them as gods and infallible suddenly realize that they're humans and the magic is broken. And, you know, we know what happens next. Um, is this a moment like that, that Putin, the infallible little father, the sort of god czar almost, um, might Russians start to look at him and go, hang on a second, he doesn't have a clue. He can't protect us. Everything he said are lies. Is that possible? And is that maybe also one of the objectives of Kiev? I, I think that is one of the objectives. I think we, we've started that process. Putin, with the power base that he's got and the way he's, his um, power base is structured, it has got such a strong position. Um, you know, He's surrounded by his oligarchs. They can only operate and make money through the criminal networks because he is giving them... Um, the freedom to do so, the freedom from prosecution, um, the freedom from anything else. And if any one of them um, steps up and is seen to disagree with them, they can disappear quite easily. And there's lots of other people that would step into their place and take over their criminal empires. Um, however, if Putin goes and goes suddenly, um, there isn't a natural successor. So you then get infighting amongst all of these you know, effective number twos that are there um, uh, vying for power, that would become very bloody and could um, actually lead to the breakup of the Russian Federation because it's not a homogenous state. Um, and they all realise that. And therefore, whilst I said earlier that I think there'll be little groups of them having careful whispers, they don't know who they can trust because they don't know who will then go back to Vladimir Putin and say, oh, you have to realise, Vladimir, that um, such and such is trying to plot against you. And then all of a sudden he falls out of a window or he's a heart attack next weekend or something else happens. And we're seeing that happening all, all, all the time. But it is undermining Putin's position in the three ways that I've outlined beforehand. One, his support base in Moscow with those that are directly there with him. Two, amongst the Russian people. And we have to remember that it was the mothers of the soldiers at the end of um, that that forced the Russians out of Afghanistan because of the casualties that were coming back, and they they were uh, they pilled into insignificance compared to the casualties that there are uh, today. But the Russian people are are the 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 green 
the shoots of seeing what's going on in reality are, are starting to come up because of the Kursk offensive. And the third thing is uh, Russia's position in the international community, both with um, the axis of evil, as we're starting to describe it, with Xi Jinping, Kim Jong-un and the Grand Ayatollah, but also in other economic groups such as BRICS um, that Russia is a, is a key member of, um, will be suddenly asking whether this all-seeing, all-pervasive, uh, um, all-controlling Vladimir Putin actually is in control anymore and can maintain this. And, and that, I think, is only a good thing for Ukraine. Cormac? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things. You know, I met a... One of the things is we should not, in the West, we should not see Russia through the same lens as we see our own societies. And we should not expect Russia to to act or for things to play out. I met a I met a um, Lithuanian um, political professor back in 2018, and he gave a presentation I shared a platform with. And I, I will always remember his words. He said, the Kremlin is a kleptocratic regime that's based on mafia and KGB principles. And so that's the first thing is don't judge Russia by the same standards we judge our own societies. But the second thing is, I think it's quite possible, Philip, I'm accepting everything that you've said that the, that what Putin fears most is his own people. Yeah. And you know, the Russian people expect their little czar to protect them. And this is really holding Putin's feet to the fire and at the moment he cannot protect them and the Ukrainians are making are making advances and they are striking deeper and deeper into Russia and indeed I don't know if any hit home but there were several Ukrainian drones shot down over Moscow earlier on today in the largest drone attack on the Russian capital. So I th I, th I think um I I mean this is the this is the this is the flip side of the of the morale boost to all levels of Ukrainian society and even to Ukraine's allies is the problem that this is creating for Vladimir Putin and I have no doubt because look you and I think we understand the Russian mindset you know, I was I worked for a foreign minister who said, um, you know, I was born in Kursk. I was educated in Moscow. I understand what Russia is all about. We need to see the world through Ukrainian yeah. eyes. And I've said this yeah. before, but I will repeat it. And we need to give the Ukrainians a little bit more respect because they're earning it every day. Because I think you're both in a very good position to answer this. Out of all the guests I have on the channel, you probably have the closest insights into this. At the moment, Ukraine is successful, and I suspect they will continue to be successful for some time. It's been two weeks. This may well stretch to months as they gain more territory, etc. And as you said, it's probably just the first stage in a multi-stage plan. The Western partners seem to have greeted this either with silence or with sort of, you know, some, some uh, um, fairly tepid congratulatory words, but no outright sort of condemnation that is the public stance. And of course, it helps the fact that Ukraine is so visibly and tangibly um, making success on the territory of Russia. Behind closed doors, however, we've seen escalation management as a key part of Western strategy. Um, Ukraine is not allowed to use attackums and um, it looks like Storm Shadow are blocked by the US, uh, not, not just uh, policy-wise, but perhaps physically through the sort of software uh, and uh, systems required to launch those. Um, there is a certain degree of timidity. And would the Ukrainians have perhaps expected some of those restrictions to be lifted and perhaps some of their more ambitious plans dependent on the West being less cautious? What do you think people uh, like Jake Sullivan and others are saying behind closed doors? Are they applauding Ukraine or are they actually having kittens and looking at ways they can shove this genie back into the bottle? I think people like Jake Sullivan and others in the White House are having kittens because I've been saying for well over two years, there are large elements in the West who are simply afraid to defeat Russia. And there has been a, there has been, and there continues to be, there continues to be a, a, a sense where we give Ukraine sufficient support to keep their head above water, but not allow them to 
ultimately deliver the knockout blow. And I think there's, in Washington in particular, and I don't know what your view on this, Philip, is, but in Washington in particular, I think there's a... Um, I think there's a there's a desire to return to some sort of a status quo. Um, a very good Ukrainian friend said to me very recently, um, he said, you know, the problem is there's people in the West, certainly people in Berlin and people in D.C., um, they can imagine Ukraine being defeated, but they can't imagine Russia being defeated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's that's I mean, I'll pass over to you. Yeah, I, I I think it's I think it's very interesting. Um, you know, I, military personnel and diplomats closely associated with military decision making will be turning around to the leaders across the West and saying we need to be gloves off and let Ukraine do what they need to do to defeat the Russians. The Ukrainians want that because the Ukrainians are focused on regaining the territory that has been illegally taken from them and restoring their internationally recognized borders. However, I think the Western governments are looking at a, a bigger picture, which is concerning them in a way that there's no right answer for it. Because, as I've said beforehand, there's no natural successor for Putin. You take Putin as the kingpin away, and him losing in Ukraine will see him being removed from post and if that's not done in a way that can be managed and it can't be managed easily and there is no solution that's there, um, then we could see the breakup of the Soviet Federation or the, of the Russian Federation. Um, and that would make the breakup of um, the former Yugoslavia seem like a Sunday school picnic. Um, and it would probably lead to China invading parts of old Russia. It would lead to... Um, uh, some of the statelets uh, having access to nuclear weapons um, because they're based there and we would not have any understanding of how they could be used or otherwise. We'd see some of the stands potentially going, here's an opportunity to get some Russian territory and coming in. We would see the Japanese turn around and say, now's the time for us to get our Kuril Island back, um, our Kuril Islands back that Russia has occupied since 1945. That would see a Southeast Asian pivot. Xi Jinping would turn around and say, um, whilst all of this is going on, the West is focused on Russia falling apart. Now is the time to take Taiwan um, and would uh, move into Taiwan. Uh, Kim Jong-un in North Korea would turn around and say, well, whilst everyone's focused on that and everything that's going on, here's the perfect opportunity for me to um, nuke um, uh, South Korea and, and to reunite um, the Korean Peninsula under my regime. And therefore, we could see a pivot that would automatically start World War Three. And I think that is why a lot of Western leaders are being exceptionally cautious in what they're doing, because they know that the rapid removal of Putin, which is what is militarily sensible, the rapid defeat of the Russians inside Ukraine, and the rapid restoration of Ukrainian borders, they know that the bigger implications of that could be hugely more massive for world peace and world stability. That's not something Zelensky is going to be concerned about at the moment, because he wants his territory back. It's not something that the military commanders are focused on Ukraine are going to be uh, uh, concerned about because they want to defeat Russia. But that wider bit is something that there is not an answer for at the moment. And the longer that you can push it off, the greater the potential there is to try and identify or engineer or create a proper opposition that could move in and uh, re-democratize Russia. But again, that's pie in the sky because there's no one sitting there. That's not there at the moment. And therefore, it's almost a bit of ostrich effect of sticking your head in the sand, and trying to push it out as far away so that that decision doesn't, doesn't come. Now, um, I could be giving our leaders a little bit too much credibility in their forward thinking and the long-term thinking and thinking about their long-term implications because not many Western leaders are very good at that uh, and therefore it could just be uh, because of the potential impact on domestic politics um, and the way that's affecting the this year of elections and we've got the biggest election that'll affect the world with the US presidential election coming up in November. It could just be that that's influencing it but I think there's a lot more going on outside that is not directly related to um, Ukraine winning, 
but has got bigger implications that will be concerning many of our world leaders. Paul well, Cormac jumps in. Um, Philip, you make it sound as if Western leaders would probably prefer the predictability of a Putin Mark II than a President Karamozar or a President Yashin. Well, yes, but Putin Mark II could be worse than Putin Mark I, you know, because it's his Mark IIs, it's his inner circle that have designed the denazification of Ukraine and designed a lot of the horror tactics that are being used. And therefore, um, there's almost a case of better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Well, Matt, I'm not sure if you'd uh, necessarily uh, agree with that or whether we should worry too much about the disintegration of Russia, because one way or the other, it's not necessarily something we can control. I think we have to worry about the uh, disintegration of the Russian Federation. Um, however, and here I maybe take a slightly contrary view to what Philip has outlined, um, I have held the view for some time that, you know, defeating Russia in Ukraine is is the key. Let me, you know, remind viewers, we face a we face a quartet effectively of enemies at the moment with Russia, China, North Korea and Iran. And this quartet is, you know, I have a saying there's more at stake in Ukraine than Ukraine. Yeah. And this quartet is is absolutely our our rules based international order is anathema to them, and you know so much so much so so much did I and most of us grow up taking our rules based order for granted, and that was the order that came out of the ashes of the Second World War, that I have no problem admitting as somebody who, you know, got an honors politics degree back in the eighties, I never heard the term until I actually went out to Ukraine. And it was the Ukrainians who told me the significance, as they saw it, of the rules-based order. Now, I go back to 2017 when Sergei Lavrov spoke at the Munich Security Conference. And he talked about, he almost rejoiced in the coming, what he saw at the time as the coming asunder of the old order, the rules-based order. And he, and he hailed the rise of what he called the post-West era. Hmm. Now, I kind of, if you'll excuse the analogy, there's a sub there's a there's a spear and russia is the tip of the spear and the two the two cutting edges are probably at the moment north korea and um and and iran but the belly the belly of that spear where all the weight is is china yeah and you know um for me and i would put it forward it's you know it's beyond my pay grade but i would put it forward maybe maybe if we defeat Maybe if Russia is definitively defeated in Ukraine, then actually it doesn't embolden. Because one of the fears that we have, if we allow Russia to win in Ukraine, and ultimately there can be no halfway, there can be no halfway house. If Russia were to win in Ukraine, or to have a perceived victory where they kept, where they kept a significant amount of the land that they have taken, given the, you know, over 120,000 live war crimes being investigated by Ukraine's prosecutor general at the moment, that would hugely embolden not just the other three members yeah. of that quartet, yeah. but then we have the other BRICs who are at best, and we have the almost virtually the whole continent of Africa and other countries in the South, who I would describe as best teetering on the fence waiting to fall into the you know the lap of that quartet so um philip i listen very carefully and we've we've indeed we've discussed this before and i've had this discussion with other people but i actually don't i think we've got to be brave Mm -hmm. I think we've got to take that chance because I don't see we have, I don't see we have an option. And this, which and 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 this halfway house of, of of you know keeping Ukraine in the fight, but not actually delivering the knockout blow. I, I don't see that that ends very well either. Yeah. So you know, oh, I come down on the side. We've got to beat Russia. Yeah. We have got to enable, not we. We have got to enable. And a one more quote. My favorite quote was from Oleksiy Reznikov, who was the last Minister of Defense. And again, something stick in my mind. It was, I think, the twenty third of December, twenty twenty one. And you know, Oleksiy went on CNN and he said, "We don't want to expect your boots on the ground. Just give us the weapons we need, and we'll do our own fighting." Now. Mm -hmm. I'm absolutely accepting what you say, Philip, about combined arms operation and the time that it takes. But I still think that we have not given Ukraine 
yeah. sufficient backing and sufficient permission. We need to take the handcuffs off as well. But, you know, this is, oh. we're not going to reach a, between you, I, and Jonathan, we're not going to reach a conclusion on this. There's wiser heads than yeah. ours. But that's my penneth worth for tonight. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you completely because um, what I didn't say when I was talking about if uh, the West's concern about uh, defeating Russia and uh, Russia falling apart is if we don't defeat Russia, then we will have Cold War 2.0 that will make the um, previous Cold War uh, again seem like a very minor event. Our defence budgets uh, across the West will have to hit 6, 7, 8, 9, 10% of GDP. If uh, Putin is seen to be given... Um, uh, a control over Ukrainian territory and retain that. Um, Xi Jinping will turn around and say, well, he's done that in two or three years. All I need to do is ride out two or three years of international condemnation if I take Taiwan. And um, I can do that, um, having built up the reserves, which he's doing at the moment um, across China. And therefore, he will move in to try and take Taiwan. Uh, as he moves in to try and take Taiwan, Kim Jong-un in North Korea will go, now is the time for me to go for the South. The Japanese will turn around and say, Russia's at, at, its, at its weakest. This is the only time we're going to get the chance to take the Kuril Islands back. So it will potentially stimulate a third world war um, if we let Russia retain any territory. And this is the horns of the dilemma that we're on. There is no good answer. Can I finish with one suggestion, if not an observation? You know, in the last 30 months, what one of the things that this, um, and I'm and, and interested to know what you think, Philip, is we've not necessarily discussed this, but one of the things that the last 30 months has done, it has put more steel in the spine of NATO yeah. And it has seen more NATO, it has seen more NATO unity than possibly any time in the alliance's yeah. existence. But also what it has done is it has brought two very, very significant new members into NATO in Sweden and Finland. And yeah. we all know how we all know how we all know how um lethal the Finns can be if they're if they're messed with from the winter war of 1938 and you know sweden is a although a small country is a you know a very impressive country as well there is i mean i mean if we stand back how much has ukraine learned is there a pound for pound man for man is there a greater fighting force on the face of the earth than ukraine at the moment no. how strong would nato be and I know we're some way away from this because they still haven't even been given a clear path to membership when the war is over, whatever that looks like and whenever it is. How much stronger would NATO be emerging from this if Russia were to be defeated and Ukraine were to be taken in with already, we know the strength of Finland and the strength of Sweden. So that's that's my counterbalance or my counter argument to the doomsday scenario which you are setting out about what goes off and we also know i think it was at the last nato summit in dc that they invited um allies from the what i'll call the pacific rim i.e japan yeah. and australia and new zealand in as well so yeah just to try and end on a positive note yeah and, well and this this is where we're seeing a, a southeast asian pivot with nato um and the, the next deployment of UK carrier group with HMS Prince of Wales is going to be to Southeast Asia again. Uh, and the, the, the other bit that has been brought into our, our defence capability, which is essential, is the defence industrial base and the recognition that that needs to be grown and is growing rapidly um, is the best preparation that, we, that, that we've got um, over and above Sweden and Finland joining. And they are phenomenal. I've worked with both of the militaries in the past and they scare me. They're great. Maybe the last contentious question, is the West falling back into a complacent slumber? Zelensky made an honest rebuke, I think, in one of his evening addresses this week. He simply called on France, the US and the UK to provide the aid that has already been approved and allocated. So it suggests there's a certain gap between the promise and the provision. There's also delays on providing the $50 billion loan, which is secured against Russian assets. 
if we are going to secure victory for Ukraine or help them secure victory, maybe we don't even need to talk about, you know, huge new tranches uh, of weapons and new systems. We just need to get on and provide what's already been promised. I, I think the problem with that is, uh, and this is something that our governments have been woken up to, which is another positive out of um, support for Ukraine, is we've promised it because that's a good sign by it to go out publicly. We don't have it to give. And therefore it is taking, you know, to, to refurbish military equipment that um, you have on paper got at readiness in stores and all the rest of it is not at the readiness that it's been in paper and the politicians have suddenly realized that actually it's gonna take six, eight, nine months to get it refurbished so it works again. And that's the reality of what's coming in. And therefore, reality is hitting the political sound bites that are going out. And the, and this is what's causing the, the, the slow delivery of equipment and aid. And I think this year in particular, it's also the domestic politic, political influence that um, is impeding some of the decisions for all the wrong reasons. You know, the $60 billion dollars being released from the United States that's that sat uh, undecided for over six months was purely because of one individual not putting it to a vote in the House, linking um, the whole decision to a domestic political issue with regard to um, the, the uh, issues on the Mexican border um, because he was playing his little power base. And unfortunately, individuals with little power bases like that can affect what is going on and to him, domestically in the United States, he didn't care whether that resulted in another 10, 15, 20,000 Ukrainian dead because it didn't affect him directly. He wanted his little political um, power struggle to, to go on because he hasn't seen it firsthand. Um, it, it's really complex and it's the Ukrainians that are suffering for all of us. You know, democracy is complex. And um, there was, I think there was a sense that we were complacent, but we have, I think we have become a lot less complacent. But, you know, I said at the start of the year, we should have put our industries on a war footing two years ago. We are doing it now. And, you know, Phil, as you just as you just set out, it takes time. It takes six, nine months, 12 months to actually get those production lines moving. Oh, two, um, two years, three years, four yeah. years, five years in yeah. some cases. Yeah. But, you know, I mean, what we have, as I say, democracy is messy. And the um, going back to my point on NATO, I think what has been achieved, we should also give credit for what our governments have achieved mm. in terms of in terms of greater unity. But remember, this is ultimately a battle between democracy and autocracy. Yeah. And the thing about battling against autocracy, they will use our democratic values against us. And they will seek to divide and rule. And they know because it's it's far harder for 30 NATO, or is it 31 now, NATO nations to make a decision than it is for one autocratic um, Putin or Kremlin regime. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I will always say we're not doing enough fast enough. We need to take the handcuffs off. We need to go all in behind Ukraine. And especially now, what we've seen in the last few weeks... And it stunned you. It stunned the world. It stunned you. I know that they can, that they can, that the that the Ukrainians can operate this complex combined arms NATO level operation. Um, you know what more do the Ukrainians have to do to prove themselves? Mm -hmm. That's my that's my final thought. That's a very strong place to end, I think. Gentlemen, thank you so much. This has been a, an incredibly stimulating debate. I think the audience will uh, share that with me and hopefully we'll see a lot of that uh, in the comments and a lot of vigorous debate as well. I hope to be able to repeat this format, especially uh, if it goes down well with the uh, channel's audience and hopefully it'll have an impact if any Western decision makers are watching this as well. But for now, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Jonathan. Jonathan, thank you very much.